I'm embarrassed to freely admit this, but I didn't know the difference between an MP and an MPP until probably after university. My civics teacher was boring. I was more into science. My dog ate my homework. I'm a terrible Canadian. So what are these mysterious acronyms, and what's the difference? Isn't this just all a big duplication of effort? Let's take a look. Hi, you're watching Gabby on Government. I'm Gabby, and I'm an ordinary Canadian citizen on a journey to learn about my government. Thanks for joining me on today's journey, where we will be talking about MPs and MPPs, the provincial and federal government, and the carbon tax. It's kind of a long story, but in Canada, we demand to have representation and not be ruled by a bunch of aristocrats. So, long story short, we are represented by a Member of Parliament, or MP, on a national, i.e. federal level, and a Member of Provincial Parliament, or MPP, provincially. So, federally, there are 338 MPs who all represent different geographic regions of Canada. MPs represent their constituents' views on federal issues in Ottawa, specifically in the House of Commons, where they discuss the federal issues of the day. Just a side note, you may have heard that MPs make up Parliament, but people commonly mix up the term Parliament and House of Commons. The House of Commons refers to a group of MPs duking it out in a fancy room. Parliament refers to a body that is, yes, partially made up of this group of 338 MPs, aka the House of Commons, but also includes the Senate and the Queen. So Parliament equals MPs plus Senate plus Queen. Anyways, MP means Member of Parliament. Let's move on to our Members of Provincial Parliament. MPs, known as MLAs or Members of Legislative Assembly in some provinces, represent geographic groups of Canadians on provincial issues. MPPs don't all get together in Ottawa like MPs do. MPPs stick to their provinces, except from time to time when they ask the federal government for money. MPPs hang out in the Legislative Assembly of their province's capital. So, if you live in Ontario, for example, the Legislative Assembly is in Toronto and it's commonly referred to as Queen's Park. Just like the MPs at the federal level, MPPs get together in their provincial capital to discuss the provincial issues of the day. If you're an ignorant Canadian like me, or, I don't know, a business analyst, you're probably thinking, this sounds like a big duplication of effort. Well, you're kind of right. It's easy to see how many issues, for example, healthcare, uh, natural resources, affordability, are topics ca that can be and often are dealt with at both a provincial and federal level. I want to talk a bit more in depth about the provincial and federal levels of government, so for clarity, I'm now going to pivot the conversation from speaking about the collection of MPs as the federal government and the collection of MPPs as the provincial government. The Canadian Constitution tries to do a good job of splitting powers between the provincial and federal government. A good simplistic view of how powers are split between the different levels of government looks something like this but it's a bit simplistic. If you want to be a real keener, you can look below to where I've linked the section of the Constitution which outlines every area that the federal government has power over versus which areas the provincial government has powers over. They range from really broad to really narrow. The federal government, for example, has power over any type of taxation, the postal service, weights and measures, interest, marriage and divorce. Um, some examples of provincial powers are property rights, municipal institutions, provincial taxation, education, and natural resources. The relationship between the provincial and federal government is actually very much like a marriage. The two people in the marriage more or less know which responsibilities are their duty, which duties they share, who normally has the final say on what issues, sort of like an informal marital constitution. But like in any marriage, there's sometimes tension between the bounded parties. And just like in a marriage, even when the provincial and federal government fight, they try to make it work for the children. While the Constitution tries to split governmental powers to avoid tensions between the provincial and federal government, tension between the provincial and federal government is literally one of the defining features of Canada. It's worse than the tension between the state and federal government in the U.S. We're like that married couple that you always hear shouting at each other upstairs while you're trying to sleep. Tell me what I wanted to hear to get me to pull that f***ing 
our history is riddled with squabbles, including Quebec trying to separate, gay marriage rights, law enforcement jurisdiction, taxing rights, the list goes on. One example of tension between the provincial and federal government is playing out right now in Alberta. You may have heard that in April last year, Canada imposed a countrywide carbon tax. A carbon tax aims to be a fair and effective way to reduce carbon emissions and combat climate change. Alberta, who depends on carbon emissions for a lot of its revenue through the oil sands, argues that the federally imposed carbon tax violates its provincial jurisdiction as outlined in the Constitution to regulate its own natural resources. Now, the Canadian Constitution states that the government can, quote, make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Canada. Sort of like the Canadian equivalent to the U.S.'s right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In this section, it says that the federal government has the right to make laws on, quote, matters of national concern. Canada argues that protecting Canadians from the ravages of climate change falls under this heading, and therefore the carbon tax should remain. So who is right? Just a few days ago, Alberta's Court of Appeal ruled that the carbon tax is unconstitutional. The decision by the majority three of four judges said that if the carbon tax is allowed to stay, it would be a, quote, Trojan horse and would allow the federal government to erode provincial power through this matters of national concern rule. They say that if climate change is construed as national concern, then so can education, infrastructure, all sorts of things that are under the jurisdiction of the province. But the story of Alberta and the carbon tax isn't over yet. It will be settled in the Supreme Court later this month. From a law perspective, which in the end tends to be the most important perspective, the whole issue is super technically complicated and I feel like you need to be a constitutional lawyer to actually understand it properly. One thing is certain, this isn't the first time Canada has had issues with our split between provincial and federal government, and it won't be the last. So why in the world did Canada decide on this crazy divided system that creates this duplication of effort and disruption? Why has no one done something about this? The UK, France, and Sweden are all examples of governments that only have a national level of government. There's no such thing as provincial powers. They only have MPs who represent their geographic region, no MPP. This is called a unitary system of government, and no doubt it's more efficient. So why did we do this to ourselves? Canada, among others like the US, Australia, and Germany, has what's called a federal system of government. As we learned before, every citizen under a federal system has a federal and regional representative. Why would any country willingly have this massive argument causing duplication of efforts? Well, the answer is a little bit different for every country. For Canada, when our constitution was drafted, the writers wanted a unitary government because it would be more efficient and, well, united. But there was one big problem. Canada at that time, and arguably still today, was not united. I bet you can guess what the division was. Not everyone spoke the same language, and with that language divide came distinct value system. Quebec was like, we rightfully conquered slash stole these lands, we want our own distinct nation. And English speakers said, well, we rightfully conquered slash stole it from you, so sorry Quebecers, you're Canadian. French and English was not the only divide. There were also big differences between the well-established maritime provinces and the less developed western part of Canada. So in order to compromise and to get everyone on the same page, it was decided that Canada would adopt the clunkier federal system of government we know now instead of going with the unitary system. Okay, so let's bring all this information together. My head hurts. MPs represent us at a federal level. MPPs represent us at a provincial level. The federal and provincial government both answer to the constitution, which tries its best to split powers between the two. This causes a lot of tension between the federal and provincial government, but it's the best way we can come up with to keep everyone united as Canadians. And there are big benefits to being united. The provinces help out others when times are good and get help when times are bad. The final point I want to make is the importance of knowing the difference between who represents you federally and who represents you provincially. I'm just trying to help out your dinner party skills. 
It's no good getting mad at Justin Trudeau because you don't like the sex education curriculum. And it's no good getting mad at Doug Ford or Jason Kenney because you don't like how much you pay in income tax. In a future video, I want to speak about how you can influence your MPs and MPPs, and to do so, it's important to know what's under their control. So, what do you think? Do you think that Canada would be better off if we had a unitary system of government like the UK? Or do you think provincial representation is important enough to put up with the inconvenience of our federal system? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm not a civics expert, so if I got something wrong or you want to add something, let me know in the comments. I write and post these videos as a hobby, so if you like them, I would be so grateful if you would leave me some encouragement by liking this video and subscribing. Thanks again, and see you next time.